Freddie Pritchard, the Weed King, and you're watching the Great Canadian Smoke Show. In less than a year now, the Canadian Liberal government is expected to lay down on Canadians the Cannabis Act Bill C-45. Tougher changes and additions to our impaired driving laws, Bill C-46. The ushering in of handheld testing devices for all of our police officers, Bill S-230. For the last few weeks, and over the course of many more to come, I will be dissecting on the shows with guests the details of these proposed acts. For if you're a grower, a buyer, a seller, a manufacturer, or a consumer of cannabis, you're going to need this information. You're going to need to know what you can and can't do this coming July 2018. I'm Freddie Pritchard, the Weed King, and here's where you're going to find out. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode at Cannabis Culture's Pot TV Studios. This is another episode of the Great Canadian Smoke Show. This is episode 10, and we're going to quickly recap this week really quickly and briefly on some of the uh, things that are proposed in C-45, and then we're going to talk the history of the man himself, Mark Emery. We're going to talk about his extensive and very extensive uh, Canadian cannabis history as a political uh, fighter and uh, the stander of those in this cannabis movement. A lot of things that we'll talk to you about bringing up the history will be from a lot of things, a lot of time when a lot of the people that are watching right now weren't even born yet. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of people that are watching that were around then know Mark Mark Emery's history quite a bit, so it'll be a great refresher for you guys. And then later on in the show, we're going to bring Mark Emery on himself through Skype. So I'd like to welcome everybody who's watching on the YouTube channel, uh, uh, Pot TV's YouTube channel, and everybody who's tuned in where we're simultaneously broadcasting over on Cannabis Culture's Facebook. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in to the Great Canadian Smoke Show, episode 10. So I guess we'll dive right into it because I've got a lot to talk about. So I think what we'll do is just quickly bring up a real quick recap, folks, because you guys just need to know it's going to be on the topic of discussion of what we're going to be talking to Mark Emery about and asking him an opinions. We have several questions lined up that it'd be great to have him and me talk about here with you guys on the show. So if we could go ahead, Alyssa, please, we'll just bring up this re-quick cap that we've been figured out. Uh, for those of you on the show, over the course of the shows, we've been going over the C45, S230, C46. And in summarizing a lot of that stuff, we found out that there's going to be illicit cannabis, which is uh, legal, and illicit cannabis, which is going to be illegal. And it's going to be illegal to possess, distribute, or produce anything that is known to be illicit cannabis. There'll be no selling of cannabis to anyone over or under of 18. And for it's also illegal legal for a young person to possess or distribute more than five grams of cannabis and or grow one plant. Cultivation maximum plants, four per dwelling with a hundred centimeter uh, height restriction as well. Punishments for everything can either be where they've, uh, everything lined out in what we've gone over has been punishment can either be A, an indictment and liable of, to imprisonment for a term of not more than 14 years, and the exception was in possession five years and cultivation seven years, B, or a summary conviction or a fine of not more than 5,000 and or six months. And as well, uh, uh, for those under 18, you'll be punished and sentenced under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. So there's the protecting of your children uh, um, um, in either a summary conviction or an indictment. And of course, for all organizations we found, which included an LP, for all organizations we found everywhere was fines for them. They didn't seem to face such strict, harsher punishments. Then that could be up to as high as 100,000. There's also ticketable offenses for 50 grams or or less of dried cannabis, five or six plants, in respect to a single cannabis plant that is 150 centimeters or more, one and over uh, limit, and still resulting in your criminal record. No organic solvents we found out. We found out about the cannabis tracking system. We also found out uh, they want to enable the, the, the tracking of cannabis to prevent cannabis from being diverted 
to an illicit market and to prevent illicit cannabis from being a source of supply of cannabis in the legal market. And we find that the cannabis track tracking system will play a key role um, in this dis- defining of what is illicit and illicit cannabis. Then we also read about Section 7 in detail of inspect- proposed inspectors with sweeping powers to search and get warrants. We also talked about police enforcement that will remain in contravention of this act. Searches and seizures and forfeitures will all remain in contravention of this act. Thank you, Alyssa. So, quickly, and running things off briefly to look at you guys, what we're looking at here for public possessions, possession of illicit cannabis, possession of more than non-budding plants over on the right, you can see, and we did talk about these things in several shows for you if you're just tuning in. Uh, We talked about all this stuff extensively on the last shows. Public possessions. Down, down lower the distributions. Like these are all things that are fa- that are going to be illegal and a punishment with all those things over on the right. And you can see where it's fairly excessive indictments of five years and 14 years for a lot of things. Summary convictions. And then where it tells you the same things where those ticketable offenses are. Can I go to the next screen please, Alyssa? And here's just the final update. That This was the lower half of that page. Uh, and here's where it talks more about distributions, possessions, uh, production, sale, more indictments, 14 years, summary convictions, 18 months. It just I, I just want you guys to get an idea what you're looking at, how many things you're looking at, and all the things that we've been talking about. Thank you, Alyssa. So that was just briefly recapping you guys and bringing you up to speed on some of the things that we've been talking about here that are serious issues to people that are in this cannabis community. Whether you're a grower, a trimmer, a concentrate maker, an edible maker, a topical maker, or maybe you're just a consumer. you got to get your cannabis somewhere. wonder where you're getting it now. But we figured out a lot of serious things and gone over a lot of things, and uh, I appreciate you guys keeping up on these shows and what we've been talking about. I'd like to also uh, bring your attention to the description box below as I do every week as well. For those of you watching on Facebook, you can go to pot.tv um, uh, to see in their description box as well. One of the things I want to bring your attention to is the BC survey that's going on and anybody that doesn't know about it by now, it's down there in the link. You guys can answer or get your questions in on BC and I think it's going till November 5th. So uh, that would be decent for those of you tuning in. We went over that in detail last week with Alyssa. Alyssa took our test for us last week. And we went over this, We went over that pretty in detail on last week's show. So if you're interested in seeing that or doing the survey, please check that out. So, okay, I think I'm going to jump right in uh, here with sparking up this doobie. I think I'm going to just jump in because I've got some extensive history that I'm actually proud to share with you guys because I know a lot of people that are out there tuning in from other countries, might not be too up on a lot of the Canadian law and things that have happened with our Canadian cannabis movement. And then on the contrary, there's probably quite a few of you that have kept up and stuff. So this history, of course, will, uh, you know, uh, bring you guys back. Now, the Cannabis Culture franchise has got a, got a fairly big history in, in Canada, and it was all invented by Mark Emery himself, and he's got an extensive, extensive political and cannabis activism and reform history here in our, in our country. And I'm honored to be able to bring him on here tonight because, <clears throat> to be honest with you, that's why I'm sitting here in front of you today was for guys like this and the guys that I've had on here and told them so on the show, Jeremiah Vandermeer and Neil Magnuson, people that that I've looked up through and listened to talk through over the years and stood behind sort of thing. So I'll delve into some things and, you know, for those of you that are watching, a lot of this has happened. I'm going to outline the dates. A lot of this has happened before a lot of you people were even born. So maybe when I'm reading through all the things, because we practically list every year off here, I'm going to. Maybe you can figure out on the year you were born 
you know. But Mark, uh, Mark Scott Emery was born 1958. He is a Canadian cannabis activist, entrepreneur, and politician, often described as the Prince of Pot. Emery has been a notable advocate of international cannabis policy reform. He has been active in the New Democratic Party, the Freedom Party of Canada, the Unparty, the Marijuana Party of Canada, and the Conservative Party of Canada, as well as the British Columbia Marijuana Party and the Green Party of British Columbia. As a political libertarian, Emery also protested against Sunday shopping laws, obscenity laws, political endorsement of sporting events, Canadian censorship, and several taxes. Emery has been jailed several times and in 2009 was sentenced to a five-year sentence in the, in the United States federal prison for selling marijuana cannabis seeds into the U.S. Mark Emery is married to Canadian cannabis activist Jody Emery and currently they reside in Toronto, Ontario. He dropped out of high school in 1975 at the age of 17 to purchase a used bookstore on Richmond Street in downtown London, which was renamed City Lights Books Bookshop. Emery operated this bookstore for 17 years until selling it in 1992. He ran for the New Democratic Party's campaign in London East in 1979 federal election. He ran for the Libertarian Party in Canada in 1980 federal election, finishing fourth. In November of 1982, Emery runs for alderman in Ward 3 in Hamilton, Ontario, and places fourth. The Unparty uh, would change its name to the Freedom Party of Ontario. In 1984, the Freedom Party and the No Tax for Pan Am Games Committee founded by Emery and Metz, select, select, successfully campaigned against London's bid for the 1991 Pan-American Games, saying the city would lose millions. In 1985, R Emery runs for alderman in Ward 3. In December 1986, Emery is charged under the Retail Business Holiday Act for opening his store on Sunday. He is later cleared of charges of opening on Sunday because a provincial judge ruled that the prosecutor failed to prove that Emery was the owner of the store. In 1987, during a strike by city workers, Emery pays for truck rentals and volunteers to pick up garbage and do the jobs for the people on strike. This causes outrage, leading the strikers threatening to dump garbage on Emery's front lawn. In 1987, uh, Emery defies Ontario's Sunday shopping laws. For those of you who don't know, we were not allowed to shop here at that time on Sundays. Uh, facing, he faced eight charges, which sounds pretty ridiculous now, considering um, everything is, 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 is Sunday shopping. But however, uh, he was facing char uh, um, he was facing eight charges after opening for eight Sundays in a row. Later, he is ordered to pay $500 fine for refusing to follow the opening charges, vowing to go to jail rather than pay the fine in June of 1988. He is sent to Elgin Medical Center. Uh, uh, he is sent to Elden Middle Sense Detention Center after being convicted of the first of the charges. And then in June in 88, he is sent uh, charges and then refusing to pay the fine. Friends and customers of his bookstore, they hold a vigil and, or, and, or, and they pay the fine. In 1987, Emery ran as candidate for the Freedom Party of <clears throat> Rural Constituency of Middlesex near London. He places fifth. And in 1990, resigning from the Freedom Party, Emery retained the London Regional Art and Historic Museum, now called Museum London, for his first ever Pop Pro Rally. In 1991, Emery is convicted of for selling copies of two live crews rap CD as nasty as wannabe, which uh, has been deemed obscene and banned in Ontario. He was given one year probation, but immediately after he beat his sentence in, he began selling marijuana-related literature and High Times magazine, all in violation of Canada law. Emery invent, invited local police to his store to arrest him and even sold copies of the banned marijuana grow books right outside the London, Ontario police station. But the police refused to charge him or interfere. He also sponsored visits from marijuana luminaries such as Ed Rosenthal, Stephen Hager, Jack Hare, and Paul, M Paul Mavrides. In 1984, Emery moved to British Vancouver, British Columbia.
and that's a good time to stop for 420. Take a quick little break. You want to dab for 420, or can we? Can that only be for 710? <laughs> oh, we got some wheat going. Oh well, let's smoke this and do a dab. You want to do a dab? Sure, thanks to my sponsors. Yeah, we can too. You want to look at some stuff we're hitting here on the show tonight? Some rock star Kush again, folks. It's one of my favorites, personals. Looking really nice too. And Thompson Caribou Concentrate's been helping out my show. Got some nice looking shatter sitting there. <coughs> some more rock star Kush. Look at that. Looks tasty. <coughs> Liberty Farms. Thanks a lot both them guys helping out both of my shows really appreciate the product they've been laying on me yep that looks really fresh eh? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Taking pictures no I'm, it's not it's different eh? because you can tell the difference i've been playing with that one touching it kissing it licked it i licked it once or twice you might want to do the other one <laughs> <laughs> awesome well yeah you want to do what do you want to do you want to try why don't you try that fresh one sure there you go okay great one and there's there's a dabber interesting stuff so far we're up to the point here at 420 where mark emery has moved himself to vancouver bc where here we are at the pot tv studios it gets good from here on out though the story dabs up all around Alyssa. Thank you. and yeah there's Alyssa, folks i didn't give you a proper introduction i apologize but geez you're hitting it up Dabs all around for everybody, smoking your joints. Happy 420. How was that tasty? Oh, that was really nice. I didn't go overboard that time. I could... You want to cleanse your palate with this joint? Mm. <laughs> Maybe I'll hit on a little one of that too. <coughs> interesting stuff, interesting stuff. I just did a tiny one too. <laughs> so in 1984, <coughs> Memory moved to Vancouver, British Columbia, and founded a store called Hemp BC. His store played a major part in expanding Canada's very thin, small underground industry of cannabis. This was the beginning, folks. Uh, <coughs> selling paraphernalia, bongs, and pipes. All illegal to sell or promote in Canada under subsection 462.2 of the criminal code. And they were not ready available at the time. Emory imported and wholesaled a variety of bongs, pipes, and other cannabis-related items and encouraged other people to open up hemp stores across Canada. In 1994, a court challenge sponsored by Emery convinced an Ontario judge to overturn the Canadian prohibition of marijuana and drug-related literature, making it legal for High Times magazine and marijuana grow books to be sold in Canada once more. In 1994, after attending High Times Cannabis Cup and be inspired, being inspired by a Dutch seed store named Sensi Seeds, in early 1995, he launched Cannabis Canada magazine which was renamed Cannabis Culture Magazine in 1998. In 1995, Emery and his seed business were featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, leading to a deluge of media attention. Emery, uh, one month later, in, in 96, Hemp BC was raided by the Vancouver police, who seized Emery's bong seeds and charged him with selling marijuana seeds and promoting vaporizers. He was later convicted and gave a $2,200 fine, $500 for each count of selling marijuana seeds, and $200 for vaporizer promotion. Emery reopened his store the next day and continued to sell par mar marijuana paraphernalia and seeds. By 1997, he had expanded his store to include a grow shop, a legal assistance center, and a cannabis cafe, which featured, featured a custom-built vaporizer built into every table. In 1997, Mark Emery was featured on CNN Impact in an episode called Cannabis Canada. The announcer referred to Emery as the Prince of Pot, and ever since then, the label has stuck. This drew major international media attention to Emery and his Hemp BC store once more. 
Now in December of 1997, the Vancouver police returned again, once emptying this store where we sit today of seeds and paraphernalia, as well as taking the vaporizers out of Cannabis Cafe. Police claim to have seized about $1.6 million worth of million dollar marijuana-related merchandise, plus tens of thousands of marijuana seeds. Emery was jailed, but not charged with any seed or paraphernalia offenses, but he was charged and con convicted for insulting a police officer because he spat at a police officer. While they were forcibly removing protesters in front of the store, in a later interview, Emery said, I, found, I was found guilty and fined $200. My defense was that it was justifiable as they were assaulting my employees. We have videotape of them kicking, shoving objects at, using a truncheon, and pulling on the hair of David Malmo Levine and Ian Roberts. I want to show my disgust in a nonviolent way to draw police towards me and away from my employees. And Emery was also banned from returning to the 300 block of West Hastings where his businesses were located. Emery reopened the Hemp BC the next day and then sold the store to a manager to his manager shortly after who suffered repeated raids during 1998 and then had her business license revoked by the city. In 1998, Emery's seed business was raided again and Emery was charged with selling marijuana seeds. Another raid on September of 1988 again, again uh, saw Emery jailed overnight and his seeds confiscated, but again, no charges laid. He was convicted from the April raid in 99 and given a $2,000 fine. In 98, Mayor, in, in 98, Man, Vancouver Mayor Philip Owen, he told the New York Times that Hemp B.C. was going to be toast by September. Court documents showed that four American Navy undercover agents, court documents showed that four American Navy undercover agents attempted to buy marijuana and smoke it here at the Cannabis Cafe. The documents showed the Naval Criminal Investigation Service agents worked in a joint operation with Vancouver police in the April of 1998. And also in 1998, Emery was convicted of charges for selling marijuana seeds and received a $200,000 fine. He switched his walk-in marijuana seed business to a mail order only and continued to publish Cannabis Culture magazine. In early 2000, he was expanding again, and folks were proud to say, with the establishment of Pot TV, a marijuana-related video channel. And that's where we are. In 2001, Emery was featured presenter in Idea City, an annual gathering of notable Canadians organized by Moses Zamer, Namer. And in 2002, then, U.S. drug czar John Walters visited Vancouver to give a speech at an event sponsored by the Vancouver Board of Trade. Emery bought a table for himself here and other local activists, and they heckled Walters as he spoke about the need for Canada to embrace the war on drugs. From 1998 until his arrest in 2005, Emery paid provincial and federal taxes as a marijuana seed vendor totaling nearly 600000 In 2000, he was a founding member of the Marijuana Party of Canada, a political party running to fully legalize cannabis. Emery ran for the Canadian House of Commons as a Marijuana Party candidate in 2000, federal election, and finished six out of ten candidates in Vancouver Centre. 2001, he helped found the British Columbia Marijuana Party, BCMP. In 2005, British Columbia election, Emery ran for the BC Party in Fort Langley, Alter Grove, but was defeated. In 2007, Emery is featured on a CBC document film, Prince for Pot. Prince of Pot, the U.S. versus Mark Emery, and CBC Don Zone episode, Cannabis. He also appears in a 2007 documentary called The Union, The Business Behind Getting High, and a 2007 seven comedy documentary called Super High Me. In 2003, when the prohibition of uh, cannabis in Canada was in limbo due to court decisions that struck down the marijuana he, uh, laws in the government's medical marijuana program, Emery launched the summer legalization tour traveling to 18 cities across Canada to openly smoke marijuana in front of police stations and demonstrations that marijuana was currently legal in Canada as featured in the documentary Escape to Canada. 
And I was down there smoking with him when he came to Windsor, Ontario back then. In 2004, Emery was sentenced to 92 jails in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Emery had been uh, convicted of trafficking because a witness saw him pass a joint in March of 2004. Emery's supporters held an ongoing daily vigil outside the courthouse until he was released. And on October 18th, he was released from the Saskatoon Correctional Centre from after serving 61 days. In 2005, the Canadian police, acting on a request from the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, simultaneously raided the BCM, BC Marijuana Party bookstore and headquarters in Vancouver and arrested Emery for extradition to the United States. Outside a local storefront in the community of Loth Lawrencetown, Nova Scotia, where he was attending a hemp fest, he was arrested. Authorities charged Emery and co-defendants Greg Keith Williams, who is marijuana man here on Wednesdays, and as well as uh, Michelle Rainey. Michelle Fenkerek Rainey on Van, uh, in Vancouver with conspiracy to distribute marijuana, conspiracy to distribute marijuana seeds, and conspiracy to engage in money laundering. Even though all the alleged offenses, folks, occurred here in Canada, Canadian police did not lay any charges. On the day of Emery's arrest, American, American DEA Administrator Karen Tandy released this following statement. And this is, we're talking about cannabis. Today's DEA arrest of Mark Emery, publisher of Cannabis Culture Magazine and founder of a marijuana legalization group is a significant blow not only to the marijuana trafficking trade in the U.S. and Canada, but also to the marijuana legalization movement. His marijuana trade and propagandist marijuana magazine have generated nearly $5 million a year in profits that bolstered his trafficking efforts, she said. But those have gone up in smoke today. Emery and his organization have been de designated as one of the Attorney General's most wanted international drug trafficking organization targets, one of only 46 in the world and the only one from Canada. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of Emery's illicit profits are known to have been channeled to marijuana legalization groups active in the United States and Canada. Drug legalization lobbyists now have one less pot, uh, one less pot of money to rely on. <clears throat> Emery was freed on $50,000 bail and prepared to fight extradition in the court. Emery and his two associates, all possibilities with life imprisonment if convicted there. In 2008, Emery had agreed to a tentative plea garden with U.S. authorities. The terms of the agreement were a five-year prison term to be served in both Canada and U.S. prison, but in return he was demanding the charges against his friend Michelle Rainey and Greg Williams be dropped. An appeal court judge ruled in 2008 in a similar case, one month jail sentence and prohibition, and probation constituted an adequate sentence for the crime of selling marijuana seeds. In a 2008 plea bargain deal collapsed because of the refusal of the Canadian government, Harper's government, to approve its side of the arrangement. In late 2008, an extradition hearing was scheduled for June 2009. However, before those hearings, Emery agreed to plead guilty to one charge of drug distribution and a five-year sentence in the United States. On September 2009, Emery entered his guilty plea and on, t on, on September 28th, he was incarcerated in British Columbia prison, awaiting extradition to the United States prison to serve five-year sentence. He was granted bail on November 18th after six weeks in a pretrial center to await the Justice Minister's decision on his extradition order. And in September 2010, he was sentenced to uh, five years in prison. And until April 2011, he was held at the Correctional Institute in Georgia, and he was transferred to Yazoo Prison in Mississippi. On uh, 2014, July 9th, Emory was released from Yazoo Prison. After completing his sentence, he was transferred to LaSalle Detention Center, and he was released over in Windsor, Ontario. December 2016, Mark and Jody Emory opened six cannabis culture marijuana dispensaries in Montreal, Quebec despite the fact that the sale of marijuana in Canada is still illegal. The store sold uh, to anyone over 19, and recalled opening an illegal dispensary as a civil, peaceful civil disobedience, stating that it was the most effective way of changing the marijuana laws in Canada. 
and revived to open dispensaries across Canada. The next day, on to, uh, in December of 2016, they were arrested at the Mount Royal Avenue store during a series of raids conducted by the Montreal police. Following his arrest, uh, Mark Emery continued to open cannabis culture and marijuana dispensaries in cities such as Hamilton and Ottawa. These shops are franchise operations. 2017, March, Mark and Jody were again arrested in the Toronto Pearson International Airport, and he faces 15 charges, including conspiracy to indictable offense, trafficking, possession for the purpose, and, pro purpose, and possession of the proceeds of crime. Jody is also facing five counts. Also, the Goodwins are wrapped up in that, and so is Brittany Guerrera, and every other, a lot of the other bud, bud people that are getting popped in from all these dispensary raids. So they were granted bail, but the bail condition uh, include a ban on possessing and consuming marijuana and other drugs. And then today, October 3rd, 2017, a cannabis culture location, Bank Street in Ottawa, was raided. Mark Emery is the recipient. From high time, um, awarded from High Times Magazine and presented to Mark Emery uh, by Tommy Chong, uh, the Lester Grinspoon Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, and it was presented to him in the 2014 Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam. So that's a lot. Uh, that was a mouthful. Did we get any contact? Crepes. We don't have contact, but it's still pretty early. Oh, uh, no, I don't know. Nope, nothing. So we're still, we're probably still pretty early. Yeah, so that's a lot. That's a mouthful of stuff right there that we threw down. Uh, and that's a lot of things happened before a lot of people in this country were, were even born, Alyssa. Like, a lot of stuff that was happening there with cannabis in Canada. Like, the history with this guy goes back a long way, doesn't it? Yeah, and then it's it's amazing to hit to hear about the uh, history that has been going on where you've been smoking weed, and I've been smoking weed a lot here at the Hastings location. That there there has been quite a few busts here over the years, and not so many lately. No. Yeah. So that was interesting. Well, okay. Um, uh, I I got to figure out how I got to plug this in somewhere though, <coughs> because it did die on me. It's over. It's right like here. But it's like way small. Sorry, folks. Technical difficulties. I thought it was going to take me a little longer to read that. It's only probably too small, though. Maybe I can get it charged up enough for what we're going to do. And we'll call up our chat room, too, and see what people are doing and talking about. Was that a lot or what? You guys should be proud. I, You guys should be proud of Mark Emery and what he's done. There's nobody, in my opinion, in our Canadian cannabis history that has that kind of a record. And that is not, by any means, uh, all of his achievements. A lot of political things were left out. Let's do a quick dab here. Shoutouts to Colby V, Med THC Ontario, Lynn Mel, Anthropod, Antridicinate Nicotima. Good to see all you guys, Ned669, Sun Green, Two Joints. Good to see all you guys out here on a chat room on a Tuesday. <laughs> Thanks for coming out and watching the Great Canadian Smoke Show on Cannabis Cultures Pot TV. Rockstar when he came out of prison, that is cool. <laughs> <coughs> Justin Healer, good to see you. So that's a lot of history. Thanks, Two Joints. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're trying to get him on the... He said he was going to contact me <coughs> at 4.30, and we're past the 4.30. So I'm, I, I, I don't know what's going on. I, yeah. <coughs> I'm not a fan of this Skype stuff at all. <laughs> I'm going to have to do another dab now. Do you want to do another dab, Alyssa? <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of history, especially for a lot of things. And 
So uh, he's the guy that uh, we want to talk to with uh, our facts thrown down here about C-45, C-46, and S-230, these come and driving laws, everything that's happening right now, the things that got said uh, in, in, that's in, in uh, the health committee. Now, I also know that it's been a, uh, back in 2015, a lot of the cannabis culture and a lot of voters were on for the Liberals Party platform to legalize cannabis. And it's fast forwarded a couple years now and we all come aware and informed on how, how they're going to do that. And uh, uh, as a lot of people are finding out now with the way a lot of activists are talking, it's more prohibition 2.0. And we heard Mark Emery talking in the uh, uh, health committee there a lot different than a couple years ago. And I do got a short a short video that we can pull up. I'd like you to check out. And to the Emirates, if C-45 is passed in its current form, will you abide by this new law or continue in civil disobedience? To answer your colleague's question, will I continue to break the law? Absolutely. Because the law, breaking the law is the only way the cannabis culture has gotten any kind of improvement in their status over the last 20 years. We've accomplished that. Marijuana's everywhere. People are growing it. There's stores opening. We don't care if we go to jail. We don't care if you charge us. We're going to do our thing because we love cannabis and we're in the cannabis culture. So I'm going to continue to break these laws. With all due respect, I find your, um, your lack of respect for the rule of law in this country disturbing because it's clear that it doesn't matter what we come with in C45, you're going to do whatever you like and obey whichever laws you like, and I don't personally approve of that. Thank you. I will encourage everybody to boycott the government stores. We will physically try and stop people from going in. We're going to advise them that they're traitors if they go to the government shops, because these are the people that have oppressed us for 50 years. You're going to give your money to the very enemy that's beaten us, killed our animals when they raid us, rounded up our kids, took away our cash, took away our plants, took away our livelihoods. Are you kidding me? We can never let the government be the profiteers of marijuana after all the years that they've abused us, exploited us, and persecuted. It's pure sadism. This cannabis law is it's pure sadism, the one you're proposing and the one that we've had for 50 years. It's just punishing Canadians for no valid reason. So that's the end of meeting 68. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, so uh, do you see a message there? No, I don't, do you? No, it's just notifications. Yeah, I guess we're stranded here, folks, because I, I don't have anybody here to... F yeah, we can do some dabs and maybe hang on a little bit because it seems like we don't have any technical fixings going on here on Skype. I don't see him. If, he's, if you're watching, Mark, you need to contact me on your Skype uh, with that email that I gave you. But it doesn't seem like that's going to suck. If I went through all that for nothing. <laughs> yes, I did. Open that up. See what's it say? Open go up and open that up. See it? Yeah, so he hasn't got a hold of me. And uh I left him my number. And he's the last he said now I know they had court today. They all had court today for their dispensary raid and they all got it put off until the seventh of November. So I know that uh I know that they're not uh in prison. So so okay, we can hang out, do a couple dabs, but I really I don't everything else was questions for Mark and it seems like well, we don't have him here and I get a little I'm a little disappointed actually from my viewers. <laughs> Spark it up.
Uh, no, there was tw uh, nothing in mainstream media, but it was tweeted out by Jeremiah Vandermeer that there was people were arrested <coughs> and products seized. And yes, Jody was retweeting about uh, the videos of people getting arrested. Uh, and people were at the side of the road yelling, shame, shame, don't you got anything better to spend your taxpayers' dollars on sort of thing. And kind of like I've been reiterating on how much of a <coughs> waste of money and taxpayers' dollars these raids have been. Uh, but that that's raid 259 <coughs> since Trudeau <coughs> has taken power. So that's just terrible. <coughs> <coughs> and it's uh come at a <coughs> it's it's either 12 million or 15 million dollars depending on if you price it out at 40,000 a raid or <coughs> leave a message there <coughs> and say this is Freddy where the fuck are you <laughs> Sure. <laughs> no, just say, this is Freddy, where are you? And see if he answers us back. But he says, the last he said there. <coughs> yeah. Sc scroll up a little bit, because he says, keep going. Yeah, but no, keep scrolling up. <coughs> keep going. Keep going. See, he says, he's going to. Some or no, I guess that's too far up. <coughs> Shout outs to my sponsors, Thompson Caribou Concentrates, Liberty Farms. They're dedicated sponsors to my show that keep me going. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's not getting a hold of us. I'm running, I, I don't have any other content then because my entire show is fucking <laughs> basically around Mark Emery. This is crazy now that he's not here and we've been having a great conversation here since last Wednesday. We've been talking just about every day, a few comments back and forth. Everything looked like it was set up. He said he was going to be live 7.30. He's going to be setting up his Skype. But I did say that I'll probably be calling him around 7.45. Here, and that's like right now, but I don't have any contact information. So we're stalled it right out. Let's yeah, let's go to the chat room because then we can talk to my friends that are watching the live show. And shout outs to everybody over at Facebook who I can't see in the chat room. I apologize. But I am gonna be working it out so that we can have both chat rooms to see. <coughs> uh yeah, so we totally don't have Mark Emery. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, okay. Well, I don't know what to say. We'll have to. Yeah, we talked about them. If, if I'm, I'm, I'm trying to avoid repeating, but we can talk about the laws, <laughs> I suppose. Because on top, well, I wanted to say that on top of, oh, there you go. We're getting, a, we're getting a request. I wanted to say on top of all the laws that we were showing you guys at the beginning of the show. Uh, there we go. We've got. We we're we're back to Major Tom to ground control. We got we got Skype action. Okay, so but I wanted to say to all those laws, they don't include anything about the C forty five or the C forty six wasn't on there. Nothing about the driving laws, the handheld testing units, the changes in the impaired driving the changes in the impaired driving laws, uh None of that was in those things that we talked about. That's all over and above in addition. So now that you guys are schooled on what we've talked about, and we've talked about Mark Emery's history, and he's right on the nose because I did say 745, so let's call him. And he's going to see me in that other little camera, right? Hey, Mark, what's going on? Can you hear us? We got no sound. Yeah, 
Hold on. We can't hear you. Try to talk again. Um, is his, are, your, is your muted? are you muted? We we can't hear you. No. Can you hear us? He can hear us, but we can't hear you. Hmm. Something's wrong here. Hold on a second, Mark. We're trying to get this fixed. Anything, uh, it says your microphone is really quiet. Is that ours or his that it's talking about? Because we can't hear him. Sorry, Mark, we can't hear a darn thing you're saying. We're having some major technical difficulty. Can we're going we're gonna to call you back. Oh, he said okay. Cripes. Man, everybody says Skype sucks, too, that uses it. It just seems to be terrible. It's always hacked up and freezing. Is he up again? We got nothing. I can't believe this. Are we getting hacked? I wouldn't doubt it if we're getting hacked. <laughs> Damn, no, we. We're trying to get the. T we, we, we're at the same. You can hear us? You can hear us? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Mark, how's it going? We got nothing. Right, so it might, it might be at my end. It's, it says I should be good, but... Yeah, you got a microphone thing on and everything. Yeah, you look like you're okay, but... but yeah, it's not working. Maybe we could do uh, just a phone call. Can we make this go on a microphone? I got it on speaker. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is on speaker already. That is speakerphone? Okay, you can turn it up. That's as loud as it is. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, Mark, is it okay if I call you back on my phone? It seems to have a better speakerphone than just an iPhone. Right on. Nice to see you. <laughs> you got his number? No, can I have it? <laughs> I don't know if it's on there. Yeah, oh, this is so crazy. Sorry, Mark, I apologize. Um... There we go. All right, yeah. Yeah, so hold on with us, folks, uh, and stuff. We're going to try to get this figured out. Skype doesn't seem to be working now on one end, or one of our ends or their ends. Um, maybe it's one of our maybe microphones that are jacked in. We've got quite a few. Well, well, uh, man, these technical difficulties are crazy. But, but uh, okay, well, uh, like we were talking about, all the things that we've talked about combined. So can, oh, hold on. Can I squeeze through? Sorry. And then we'll put it. What's this one? Okay. Hi, everybody. This should be working. Hi there. Oh, awesome. Hey, Mark. 
How's it going? Can I get my screen up? Yeah. So I can. Good. So we're not going to be able to see you, though, are we? No. That's too bad. Well, maybe. Yeah, let's try. Can we still see you on your. Can we still see you? Somehow, or are we only going to talk on the phone? Freddie, can you hear. Oh, you can hear me fine like this. Yeah, I can hear you. Can, can, okay, good. Can you I hear? I only pressed the phone part. I didn't press the video part. In case it was interfering. Good call. Oh, okay. Okay, so I, I wanted to just test and see if you could get me on the if you my if our Skype audio was good if we just went phone and then uh, as opposed to a video call. Oh, okay, so because the video call doesn't have much substance, I'm just in the same room like doing nothing, unlike you. Yeah. Isn't it? So maybe the uh, phone Skype uh, option like there, like I'm doing now, would be better. Yeah. yeah. And then we do audio so through the, audio through the phone. Okay, so how are we doing there? Uh, how are we doing here? Can you hear me on the Skype? No. No. Oh, no. Okay. okay. Well, then we're something. We're some, screwed. Something's not right. But can we see on Skype? There he yeah, is. Now you can. Yeah. There he is, right there. But we're hearing him through the phone for sure, right? Yeah, I hear you. Fine. Uh, oh, here we go. What happened? We lost over. There's nothing. You hung up your phone. Can't hear a thing you're saying, Mark. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So sorry, Mike. Yeah. Okay, let, let's try to call him back. Yeah. What's with the thing flashing behind him over there, though? Yeah. And it's not doing it over there. Like, Skype is, is just. There okay. is that. That's weird. Okay. Oh, hit speaker. Oh, hit speaker. Hold on. Uh. Mark, do we got you? Good to go. I hope. Oh God, yeah, and you're looking. At <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Uh, we did a big, we did this big, huge beef up, talked about your whole history, a lot of it anyways, and I'm really honored to have you here, uh, 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 and, all, and I, I know all my Pot TV viewers that are watching here on what you created, uh, and, and are, are happy to see and hear you to here tonight. Hey, let me tell you a story, if you've got the time, about sure. when we first, we came up with the idea, a, a guy who was a heroin addict, actually, uh, called me up in uh, November 1999, and he said, are you guys interested in, in having a pot video station? And I went, well, what do you mean? Because I'd never seen one. They don't, didn't exist. And he said, well, theoretically, it's possible. And uh, the, the reason why no one had done it, as I would find out later, it's because bandwidth was incredibly expensive. Yeah. And that just to air uh, one minute would cost me one cent for every person that watched it. <laughs> so if I put out a video and a thousand people watch it, for one minute it would cost me $10. So uh, we finally do put, put it, get together. Uh, the heroin addict, he, uh, he lasts for about three or four months. But he does enough to allow us to assemble the parts, and we get going. And get it going. March, March 26, 2000. No one is currently used doing video online because it's completely unaffordable. But I plow on. Yeah. Because I don't know that yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, back back so then. Finally, there... so finally, finally back. We, we, can, we can do audio. And it's not very expensive. But on May 3rd, 2000, we start doing regular live content and then archiving it. And boy, did it cost me a lot. In the first year alone, it probably cost me $200,000. Like, and, and the, oh, more, wow. and the wow. more successful a video was, the more it would cost me, like, terrible. So, um, so we had some really good content. Right? Oh, absolutely. Famous. Dana's famous taking LSD 
and Magic Mushrooms. And well, like tens of thousands of people saw that. It could cost me a thousand dollars for people to watch James' show. <laughs> so, and, and, and the only advertising we had was my seed company, which was underwriting everything, everything anyway. So anyway, those are the origins of uh, Pot Team. <laughs> well, that's awesome, well, that's too. And I remember... And uh, you know what? The Flash wouldn't become available until July 2006, and that's when YouTube took over everything. Because it became affordable. Yeah, yeah, and the and I remember back then too. It was like three hundred and sixty and four hundred and twenty p. It wasn't that good quality back then either. But I remember uh, Greg Williams doing his grow show. Uh, there was like a platform. There was uh, I thought it was awesome. I thought it was really cool. The best thing I ever ever did on there's a couple of good things, but the thing we had called the contest, where we asked people from January two thousand and five. To May 2005, to send us their best buds, and Chris Bennett, and Jody, and Kurt Trusaw a lot of the time, this is funny, like the hidden past, and Dana Larson, and myself, we would smoke it in different ways. So I was using the volcano, uh, Chris was using uh, some kind of vape uh, Jody was smoking bonds, and Kirk was smoking joints, <laughs> and Dana would do it to all of them. And... We got 150, 50, 57 samples, and they never got interfered with. And over five weeks, oh, sorry, five months of, of recording episodes, we did 17 episodes. We did 10 bucks per episode. And I never got more ripped in my whole life than for each one of those episodes. And we gave out spectacular prizes uh, worth about 10 grand. And... Uh, that was my all-time favorite thing, and I think you can still see them on archive. It's called the contest. Awesome! That's good information. <laughs> hey, so listen. I get raided by DEA two two weeks after that con that contest. So they let all that bud get in the mail, <laughs> but they put spent millions trying to put me away for those seeds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that's that's a big thing I always talk about. Mark is the. Uh, some I got a few questions that I got lined up for to talk to you yeah. about if you're yeah. if you're good to hang around with us for a bit smoking. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh. I guess the basic first thing, uh, um, is like, uh, um, what back then? Back then there was no, dis, no dispensaries and there was no medical marijuana in Canada and there was no branding and there was none of all the products like there is now as much. And um, so what was your drive to want to legalize cannabis? What were the main issues? Why? Well, first of all, you need to know that Hillary got involved with that dispensary, the BC Compassion site, in probably May 98. And one of the reasons she did that is because we got busted a lot. And so she had to seek employment because MPC at the time was, was, was shuttered by the authorities. For three years. So she goes over and after spending some time in Amsterdam with Todd McCormick and watching what they're doing there, they open it in Compassion. And they are the, the only one that su survived because uh, there were strangers in the night and a few other dispensaries. <coughs> but essentially, it was only them. Until about 2005, and then in 2008, Dana starts his dispensary, the cannabis dispensary. And and we've seen many more proliferate since. And then, of course, cannabis culture was the first people in, like, uh, May of last year to sell to everybody. And, and my parents were, that this is what legalization looks like, looks like. And people need to know what it looks like so they know how this government system is so going to suck. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, because we did, I did 1,700 people to 2,000 people a day in January and February. And uh, that is like staggering. We had, we had lineups, and I would probably say our lineup was 40 deep, and yet we cleared it in 12 minutes. So you never waited longer than 12. We had 30 to 35 different kinds. We had four different kinds of hash. We had numerous different vape pens. We had candies, we had 
brownies, really great ones, from Apothecary Labs in Vancouver, great people. And, uh, and every single kind of cannabinoid you could get. We had at least five or different brands of shatter. We had resin. There wasn't any kind of, the only thing we didn't actually have was suppositories. And I can make those, because I made those when I was in Slovenia for, for cancer patients. But if someone asked for them, I would make them. Yeah. And so we had everything. Yeah, the bum darts. The government isn't going to come near that, even in the next two or three years. And yet I was able to put it together in like a week. Oh, the bum darts. The bum darts are taking off now, though, I'll have you know. What does that mean? Uh, they're, they're taking off the bum darts. A lot of people are getting aware of them and using them. Oh, right. Of course. The, the suppositories. That's, I, I, I refer well, to them as bum darts. They're the best way you should use because um, the absorption rate is higher. Yeah, um, it is. I did a... You can't get to stone. 70%. The only method, 70 the only method we, can get, we can't get sick or over stone. Yeah, no, I did, a whole, I, I did a whole I episode about with, it. I experimented with it myself. And you just get really, really high. Oh, yeah. I'm the only guy. Uh, I'm but, you, the o- but you don't get nauseous. Yeah, I'm pretty much the only guy in history there, Mark, to have done uh, two of them live on my live show. Uh, okay. I will give you one more to know. <laughs> on day three of my experiments, I ended up, first day I took 100 milligrams in one suppository. Mm. The second day I took two suppositories for good of And the third good day... It, I took three, and the reason being is because when you're doing a cancer cure, you will want to do one gram of pure oil a day for... Uh, well, that, that's a lot, Mark, because I, I, I did a thousand milligrams. I did a gram two, in, two, in two darts on a live show. Oh, um, that's too much. Well, I, I, I'll tell you, I was really high the next day, and I'll yes. tell and uh, it, you absorb it seventy percent through your body that way. I did a whole. I did a yeah. whole. Uh, oh, I do all informative stuff first, but then you know we had to shove them up but there. The body high is amazing. Absolutely. It's every other time. Yeah. And but here's the other thing. Okay. Um, I had it made. I was warned that it could make me horny. Okay. <laughs> now, this, now I take the three of them, and I find that in fact I am very aroused. And I'm in, this, I'm in this lonely white room in Ljubljana, <laughs> Slovenia, where I've been helping cancer patients and other people and making, learning everything I can from the great Bozidar Radisson. But I'm there alone, and in a bad, bad coincidence, I get a Skype chat request from uh, some woman in, in Bangkok named Ukini. <laughs> and the only sort of it is, I end up cam- camming with this girl, and uh, like 40 minutes later, and she records it. And then, so that's why I have, there's a sex tape out there. Um, and I'm not particularly proud of it, but I'm also not ashamed of it either, because I'm always thinking, well, who wants to watch a sex tape of a 50-year-old guy uh, doing his thing for four or five minutes, right? And uh, <laughs> anyway, it, it warned me of the perils of camming. Because it was a blackmail scheme. And because after she recorded, she sent it to me the next day. And she said, I will show your wife and I'll put it on the internet if you don't give me $5,000. And I said, listen, you're a blackmailer. I can't give you $5. So I, I'm not going to pay your money. So for the next 24 hours, this person berates me. Yeah, it says, you want your wife to see this? You, you want everybody to be, you want to be humiliated? But the price is coming down, but she's just spending all this day abusing me. It goes to $1,000. It goes to $500. I said, no, I'm not paying you anything. So then she does release it. And the uh, next day, uh, some of my friends say, Mark, there's a uh, video up there. And uh, probably you should be aware of it. <laughs> and so anyway, that'll be... So that's my warning about depository. <laughs> Holy fuck! <laughs> Interesting stuff, Mark. And brutally yeah. honest, buddy. I, I will yeah. have to... I will <laughs> wow. Okay, <laughs> uh, so are you up on, I mean, are you obviously up on this C45, uh, C4, C46, uh, my viewers and everybody watching the show tonight have watched uh, the two minute video that Pot TV has up of you talking in the health committee meetings, uh, yeah. where, yeah, where you were talking, so I was just going to center around some of that stuff, but uh, it, apparently, you know, none of us are going to be involved 
that are in this present cannabis uh, day culture, uh, and they're not proposed to be included at all. Uh, do you think everybody in July of 2018 is just going to up and quit? No. Now, Freddie, here's the problem. That $274 million increase that the government's giving to the cops, that essentially is the money to raise dispensaries for the next 18 months. Okay? That's, that, they gave them more money because otherwise the cities won't raise these dispensaries. Because... Policing takes up 20% of all municipal budgets. And if you go around and raid another and arrest another three, 400 people in larger communities or 1,000 people in Toronto or, you know, smaller communities, 50 people, it's going to mean hundreds of millions of dollars in policing and court costs. So they're anticipating the most severe crackdown we've ever seen. And they're getting and they're getting their finances. That's exactly what I've been saying. I've been, yeah. I've, been, I, I've been feeling exactly the same way about that and talking about that exactly the same way. It's great. Um, so um, um, what do you... Well, on the other hand, what, what else is new? We've always been, been facing crackdown. But here's the problem. What we're all betrayed is that they said this was legalization. But it's not legalized. It's, uh, it's special privileges for government cronies, it's uh, licensed producers and uh, cops and politicians who are, are involved in these stock market businesses. But yeah. the cannabis culture that actually thought we were being legalized, right? we're all still criminal. Every last one of them. Yeah, so, no, that's... Um, it's... So all the people who've been involved in the struggle are still criminals. And all the people who oppressed us, they are now set to exploit us and benefit. So, you that's know what, right. that's always government. But it's never been this cynical this severe and attacking a completely peaceful people with so much violence, so much hatred, so much bad rhetoric, and so many new laws. Yeah, you know, I, I, I had some questions and stuff, but I talk so much on my shows exactly all the same things that you're talking about. I think I should just sit back and rap with you. Uh, um, uh, but, but the facts, uh, like... Uh, Governor Heinlucan, uh, uh over in Colorado, Governor uh, Heikenlooper, he's t- he's taken six. He just signed a bill last year to take six million dollars of the legal marijuana tax dollars to fight the black market activity. And I've yeah. been I've been telling everybody on my show for over a year that that's what's going to happen with our legal tax dollars. They're going to take that. Le- right away. Uh, because there's nothing more diabolical than the government of Ontario or Quebec or New Brunswick saying we have the monopoly to sell you marijuana and that we're going to use your money to raid everybody else and criminalize all other people who are growing, selling, and even consuming illicit cannabis. So everybody who shops at a government store is a mortal enemy of ours because they are going to feed the beast that will burn and rape our culture. So people cannot be allowed to shop at those government shops. That's what and I say. Can, yeah. People cannot be allowed to work at them. We have to get the identity of anybody at those shops and make sure U.S. immigration has it so they can never travel to the United States. And they should be identified and their names and addresses published. And you might think that that's strong medicine, but we're talking about a government that has wanted to exterminate us. That's right. For 50 years. Yeah. There can be no peace and no agreement and well, no, no deal that's with anything that is behaving like that towards our culture. Yeah, because we ultimately look at it the same way now. You know, like, I guess that was my question back in the, back in the beginning uh, uh, was about the movement starting because of no prison for pot. No clogged courts, no wasting taxpayers' dollars, ruining lives and wasting police resources. Yeah. And when I look at C45 and C46 and S230, it, it's way more in every in every level. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then so, on top of that, now they create our... Cre- comforting to know that it will begin to crumble quickly. Because the, every court challenge will be successful. Um, as they always have been. The only court challenge we have ever lost 
is our Supreme Court of Canada challenge of December 2003, and where we lost six to three to have the marijuana laws declared unconstitutional. And on that note, uh, all six uh, Anglophone judges were against us, and three of the Francophone, the remaining three, were in our favor. So if we get to the Supreme Court again with the Cannabis Act, and I'm sure we will within about three years, we're going to strike almost all of it down. Because it's, it's arbitrary, overly broad, and since cannabis doesn't kill you, it's completely unnecessary to imprison, arrest tens of thousands of Canadians that the government admits has never killed anybody, and that they, in fact, are selling. Yeah. So, I mean, it's absurd. When you can have your own brewery, you can have your own home, grow, home brew, you can make wine at home, I can own a distillery, I can uh, make wine, I can buy as much wine as I want, it, I can have, get wine as gifts from all my friends, I can buy wine in 10,000 restaurants, I can buy it in stadiums where my children watch baseball. Um, alcohol is everywhere, cigarettes are everywhere, prescription drugs are everywhere, but cannabis will only be in 40 stores in the year 2020 in a province of 12 million. Yeah, by 2020, they propose 150, but they're only going to start with 40 and 80 by the end of 2018. Yeah. But um, how, do about, how do you feel well, about how do you feel about the same people that have been persecuting us for years and years and punishing us over these useless laws against the plant? How do you feel about those same people keeping us out with harsher, stricter rules? Yet now they're actually involved in it and lined up to profiteers. There's so many. Okay. But there's good parts about that, too. Because here's the big concern that everybody in the free market has. Now, I use the term free market. I don't say black market or great. Because we truly have a free market. Yeah, we trade and buy with everybody we want, with, and there's no regulation or tax tax fee. The price is artificially high because of the risk, but essentially, within that paradigm, we have a very free and peaceful, nonviolent, cooperative market. So that's great. The government, on the other hand, will be highly regulated, and therefore it will be more expensive, lower quality, and probably from a monopoly provide. So they're going to get this one source. Well, the free market's going to be way better than that. We're going to have edibles of every kind. We're going to have pens of every kind. We're going to have like 30 different kinds of weed, and maybe it'll be a pop-up thing. Maybe it'll be delivery. Maybe people will have stores. But whatever. As long as the price remains as what it is now, it's lucrative. In a real legalization, within three years, the price would drop to about $2 a gram. And then no one would be growing for profit. We'd grow for ourselves. But as long as it's going to stay worth 2200 to $3,000 a pound wholesale, we're in business. So this is good for everybody. So the government kind of guarantees that the black market will continue, and we will... Have our medical. I'm allowed to grow 80 plants. Uh, Jody's allowed to grow 80 plants. And I'm allowed to own, be own, own part of an LP. I can uh, do all sorts of stuff. I, I can participate in a lot of aspects and can take minimal risk. And I'm still going to, when I get all these cleared out, I'm going to be open stores. I don't mind going to jail. I, I, I'm, the jail has no fear to me. And well, uh, what I. Uh, what I fear is like big fines. <laughs> it, but even then, it comes you know, down to you, a question, you, though. You can't, you can't pay them if you don't have the money. Yeah. Okay. Well, it comes down to a question then, like um, uh, to be inside to be inside of the legal regime. Um, they proposing you know these LC, 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 LCBO stores uh, or private retailers, but the bottom line is, is both will have to to use the supply of the large producers. I'm just Wait, wondering. Well, at the expense of the medical people. And they're already saying uh, it's way too limiting being hooked onto one LP. We only have 58 LPs. We need about uh, oh, 300 it's, it's, to 500. It, it, it just jumped to 62 today. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Fred, you should get an LP and I should get one too. Oh, yeah. Right? But, but, the thing is, but that, that, you know what? Everybody who has an LP, except for a few, are, be, are being punished because they can't even get clones or seeds unless they buy from Tweed or canopy grows to them. And they have a limited amount of seeds. So every one of these LPs is legally obligated to grow almost the same strains, right? And, and that's suicidal. It's cradle. 
Yeah, uh, I, yeah, yeah the, the black market is able to adapt and is able to provide a variety and has access to the entire world, whereas the government's going to have access to our organogram, whose most famous claim to fame is that they poison dozens of people who are suing them now in a horrific class action suit. That's right. So, There's the, that's right. Horrendous. And then they, some people still say that the recalls worked, but the recall from Organi was 74, all of their products, 74 of them, going back in 11 months. So everybody who was an Organi Graham client for 11 months who smoked any one of their 74 products, and then Metrum, who was carrying those same products, and Aurora, who was carrying those same products, all basically smoked it. Uh, Mike Labutno, and they got well, fucking, they got fucking part sick. Part they got the sick. Have participation in that, in that company. They, they own part of yeah. organic. Well, I'll, 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 I'll ask so, you this. I mean, how cool is it that Canadian icons are with a company that poison people? Yeah, well, I, I've never seen cannabis ever be dangerous like this before. Put it into the government's hands and look what they've done to it. Hey, listen. Look, Freddie, the insidious thing is, for 50 years they tried to exterminate us. So now they're going to be solely responsible for giving us our medicine That's and right. giving us our marijuana. Yeah. Would you trust the people to sell you a pure product who've been trying to kill us? as a culture, that Health Canada to this day does not admit that medical marijuana exists. That's right. They don't think marijuana has any medical benefit. That's they right. They think we're all morally failed, flawed human beings who have to be condescended to. I'll add so that. what do you, think, do you think they're going to be thinking about us, their clients, or the marijuana they sell us? I don't think they'll be very respectful, thoughtful. I don't think they'll care about our health. All they're going to do is lecture us about how marijuana is bad for you, and there's going to be all these negative posters, and it's going to be the most depressing experience ever. Would it surprise yeah. you to know that you probably do, but would, I've been to reporting it all about it on my show. It's some of my biggest research, Mark, uh, is that it's now up to 20 approved sprays allowed to be on the Health Canada LP marijuana, and it says this exactly on the uh, Health Canada site, that it's approved, it's acceptable levels of these are allowed to pass through testing. They're allowed to spray on flowering marijuana and dried marijuana. Have you ever That's heard? That's right. Well, have because you there's no empirical science done on what happens when those chemicals are combusted. Big go. I mean, yep. when they're dealing with vegetables, for example, you can wash the residue off the syrup. You can peel a vegetable. So you can separate yourself. That's right. From that, but how do you exactly remove residue from flowered buds? Yep. And then you're going to combust, right? Now here's the other thing: I had my weed tested at my shop, okay? Yeah, and when people came in, I'd have stacks of wonderful reports, and I'd encourage people to look at it. And they said, "Well, did you look at them?" And I would say, "Yeah, of course." And they said, "Well, then I don't need to look at them because presumably you wouldn't sell anything in the state." And that was, of course, very true. But the thing is, my weed, with 184 different tests, never came back with any kind of minor, uh, trivial, or major amount of pesticide, hormones, herbicide, resin, <laughs> metal, of any kind. Okay, I now I pay the most. Okay, when I got BC stuff, I'm paying 26 to 2950 a pound. It's $400 a pound. Uh, smuggling fee or shipping fee to get drunk there. But generally, I would pay the highest because I know the best growers and I want the best pot in my shop. So, get this. I had five complaints in six months. I did 1,700 to 2,000 people a day. That's 12,000 a week. 50,000 a month. I probably served a quarter million people in the time my shop was there and I got five complaints. Yeah, did anybody... Right. Did, did anybody... Did anybody come in? Did anybody come in saying that you lost that they lost sixty pounds and that they've got blisters and they're going to do a class action lawsuit because you're right. fucking marijuana? No one made ever them. said said no one ever said there was a negative impact at all. I know. That's no why. One got, that's, no one ever got the colds or flus or allergies. They came back day after day after day. Freddie, I'm in a law office. 
Um, Jody has a press conference tomorrow with a member of the parliament about a proper pot policy. So we'll uh, have that news for you tomorrow. But I have to leave this office. So uh, we'll be to conclude our interview. Awesome. But I'll be glad to be on future shows. Oh, well, sure. Well, we'll get together again. I really appreciate you taking... Here. I like taking out the time and talking. Uh, uh, what I'm really fascinated with is how many things that you nailed on the head that I've been reporting on my show uh, and how in tune and aligned you are with what's really going on. Uh, okay. and, and I want to shout out, you have a protest this Saturday. I want to shout it out. Do you not, in Toronto, yeah. have a protest? At, uh, the legislature of Queen's Park and at you're, 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. There you go, two, and, in Toronto, yeah, right? Well, Jack, Lo uh, Jack Lloyd, uh, Paul Lewin, a uh, member of Parliament, Jack McLaren, uh, City Councilor Tim Karajanis, and uh, Trillium Party Leader Bob, uh, oh my God, I've forgotten his name, I forgot his name, but that's better than mispronouncing anyway. Uh, but he's going to be there too, and then I'm giving my first proper full-length speech since I've gotten out of prison on all the things that we've discussed together on your show, and so much more. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm, everybody get out there tomorrow on uh, on Saturday in Toronto for a big protest. Right. Yeah, and I think that uh, since they've started with uh, Prohibition 2.0, I'll just add, uh, is it not stand to reason that now we're going to become Legalization Movement 2.0? <laughs> That's a good idea. You know what I anyway, mean? Anyway, the struggle for a free people never ends. That's right. And even when we get what we want, there's people trying to take it away. Yeah. And even when politicians say, we hear you. What they hear is the things that make them want to control us. No, you control us. No politician is giving us freedom for free. They're not giving it to us unless we take it from them. So we're always going to struggle. You know, we're going to jail. We're going to get struggled. But we're going to win. See you next week. So awesome. Thanks a lot, bud. Free the weed. That, that, that was awesome. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for calling, bud. Freddy, that was fun. Yeah, that was great. I'll see you uh, again, and thanks a oh, lot. Anytime you want me on, Freddie, I'm usually home on a night like this. I wouldn't be interrupted. Oh well, shoot. Maybe we'll just be getting. We'll be bugging you in the future then, talking yeah, about cannabis. Up, that was. Anyway, good luck to you, man. Yeah, and good. Have have a good protest. Free the yeah, weed. Thanks, Bye now. Free the weed. Uh, oh yeah. That was so awesome. Uh, you know, I'm actually a little blown away, uh, because he's just nailing down a lot of the things, you know, this guy's, we just nailed off this guy's whole history. He's got more political experience with cannabis. He's got more political experience with everything before cannabis than I ever could have. I'm not much for a politician at all. I'm rough around the edges and he's got experience with cannabis and stores and, uh, protests and prisons and uh, he's definitely uh, the epitome of of the, the the wasted taxpayers dollars on him and the prison for pot and I'm just blown away that all the stuff that I talked about on my shows for two years just was all reiterated in a lot of things that Mark Emery said so I'm pretty blown away that I've been on the right path because I've been calling for a boycott against the dispensaries, or the large producers, sorry. And I've been saying that they're going to come for the dispensaries. And I've been telling everybody lately that it's going to be worse because of all the laws that we showed you at the beginning of the show that are going to be on top of the more they're going to do on that. And they're creating the competition of one and the only oligopoly supply. So that's going to be eliminate the competition. Yet the competition, which is us in this point, um, are basically deemed illegal with the laws that they're going to use against us. And like Mark Emery said, it's going to be worse, and I believe it's going to be worse too. I believe there's a lot more pound and down coming when they're done with the dispensaries. This was a really good conversation to have with somebody who's the founder of Canvas Culture and Pot TV and the history that he's got. So that was a great conversation. What do you think, Alyssa? Oh, that was a great conversation. Yeah, good, good. Okay, well, so uh, next week we'll be back because I don't think I've got anything to talk about. I guess we could pull up the chat room and say hi to anybody. Do you want to come in, Alyssa, and do another dab? Sure. Sure. 
sure hit it up. There's the chat room. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. I thought that was a great guest to have, Mark. Plus, he says he doesn't mind coming on some more, so we'll have him back on here. Hopefully, we'll be able to figure out the Skype thing. But it worked, didn't it? It worked. Yeah, yeah. Good. No, that's awesome. So, you know, somehow, so it comes around to what are we going to do about it? Now, you can see there's already a protest, the protest that's going on in Toronto. Get out there. Uh, there's going to be a lot of speakers, but it's a protest against the monopoly takeover, the uh, the oligopoly or monopoly takeover. Here's Mark Emery, leader and creator of the cannabis movement, so to speak, in Canada. I know there's a lot of other people that have done a lot of other stuff. That's no no given there, but we got to unite, man. We've got to bring together this legalization movement 2.0 that I've been talking about. So that we are all, like, you know, the people that are branding and the people that are selling and people that are just consuming, uh, got to get together over this. It was enough wasted money before. And I, I keep stressing to everybody how important it is. The people who don't cons consume cannabis, like your tax dollars, is just thrown out the door here. What he was talking about at the beginning of this of the interview there was the more money that they're going to spend, they're throwing 200, they've already, the federal government are spending another 274 million plus another 10 million on a campaign that you guys have been listening to on the radio. If you hear any marijuana commercials on your local radio in Canada or your TV, it's been courtesy of that last campaign that's going on for $10 million, but now another $274 million just for directly attack law enforcement. Uh, or, or the black market, and 161 of that for these driving laws. I had so much that I wanted to talk to him about, the driving laws and stuff like that. So you guys are getting the idea as a community. If you're in this community, what do you think they're going to, like, we have, we have uh, 259 dispensary raids. Do you guys, and they're spending everybody on all the cops and all the stories I've been reading on my shows that they're going to spend more money, more money on, on enforcement. So what do you think they're going to do after they're done with these dispensaries? Recently, the Ontario pot plan, 40 minute video, uh, uh, that I've been talking about so much and directing everybody's uh, attention to said that the dispensary's uh, day, uh, days are numbered and they can consider themselves put on notice and three or four things in there. I'm just like worried. I'm worried about the fight that's coming. So I'm about, I'm about time telling everybody that that's our next step. So here we already have a protest going on. They're getting united in Toronto. There's a bunch of speakers getting her done there. We're going to have to start doing the same thing here in Vancouver. And we're going to have to start doing the same thing in all small and big communities across this Canada community for growers, trimmers, concentrate makers, edible makers, dab lounge people, vape lounge people, all you guys in the back scenes growing that fine BC and Ontario bud, all that fine weed from all across coast to coast. You, It's about time we all got together for the stop and the claw. Clogging the courts and the waste and the taxpayers' dollars, ruining lives, stopping a prison for the bot, and this stupid liberal monopoly takeover plan. You know? So that's just my message for tonight. It was great to have uh, Mark Emery on the show. I'm really honored that he was here, actually. That was great. And to be able to bring you guys his history. Uh, I hope everybody had a good time. And uh, did you do that dab? I did. Oh, well, oh, I'm. It killed you? Yeah, in a good way. You looking good. <laughs> so, thanks a lot, everybody, for tuning into this activist channel uh, or uh, show every week. And uh, we're going to be bringing activists for you to talk with. For to talk to and bring their opinion to, and now that was a that actually interview blew me away. For those of you that watch my show in here, that are in the YouTube, <coughs> also welcome, and thanks for everybody coming out on Facebook. I'd appreciate if you guys liked my show tonight to give me the thumbs up. 
down and if you think that this message is should be shared around because that was a lot he didn't get to say that much in the health committee so that you know what i mean they, it was it was fantastic <coughs> it yeah facebook cut out the whole interview oh oh wow to hear that folks facebook cut out the whole interview yeah yeah, and I'll tell everybody that's watching my other show, The One Man Smoke Show, on Tuesdays over on YouTube. I have been three shows now on Facebook last week when I was doing a CBC on Sunday uh, interview. About an hour into my Facebook Live, they cut it too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be doing Facebook anymore, though. I've just decided that... Because they're kind of any pot. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they're, they've been banning people. Oh, okay, well, we'll get this up on. That's cool. <laughs> so we're not live on Facebook right now. We are back live, but as soon as I got my phone back, I realized it. Was... Oh, those bastards. <laughs> Jesus. So can you make it? You'll, so you'll make another video and post it? Okay. That's awesome. Well, that's technicals. That's technicals advice is for you. So, like, that's our next step. We're sitting back here. We're gonna take the and, and of course, what we talked about was all proposed. Uh, the all three of those bills are in the committee stage. They've still got a long way to go. Some people are holding it out for the senators. You know, the senators back in the day in two thousand and two, they wrote quite the. Nice article about cannabis. They weren't so bad about it. They said anybody over 16 uh, should be allowed to get it uh, or have access to it because that's exactly the same way it is now. Uh, cannabis is against the law and a whole bunch of kids are, and young people are smoking it. Everybody that I know and a lot of people on average had their first joint before 15 so, but either way, this was a great show, very informative. I thank everybody for coming out and watching uh, the Great Canadian Smoke Show. I'll be back next week. It'll be episode 11. I'm your host, uh, <coughs> Freddie Pritchard, the Weed King, and I'll see you next week. Free the weed.